to ignorance and confusion. Three men arose from humble beginnings with a message of wisdom and hope for their troubled times. Three men who would eventually change the very face of humanity. But they just got a call from Robert Mueller. So, here are some other guys. It's Song Talk Radio with Michael, Neil, Phil, and the gang. Is it me? Are we ready? I think it's you. All right. <laughs> Welcome back to Song Talk Radio, episode 3,900. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> episode 277. This is the show with songwriters talking to other songwriters about the craft of songwriting. We share tips, tools, techniques, and alliteration, and together we all become better at writing songs. I'm your host, mm -hmm. Michael Proudfoot, and joining me are the Marvel superhero members of the Song Talk Radio Action Team. We have fantastic Phil. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here, and it's uh, it's going to be a jazzy time, I think. I think so. Notorious Neil. Oh, time. I forgot my cape. Darn it. <laughs> yeah, you'll only get sucked up into the... Yeah, you'll get the sucked up into the... What, is, hold yeah, what was not, Neil? Not a good idea. Notorious Neil. Notorious Neil. Notorious. Oh, that's yeah. true. Uh, on social media tonight, we have Magneto Micah. Hi. And finally Hi. on the tech board, it's Rita the Righteous. Ooh, the Righteous. <laughs> nice. During our show, please send your comments and questions to at Song Talk Radio on Twitter or Facebook or feedback at songtalkradio.ca, and we will share them with the audience in real time. And also, please stop by our website at songtalk.ca to find out how you can be a guest on our show. But you'd be better be pretty fantastic. And our guest <laughs> this week definitely is in that category. He is the master of the devil's horn, Richard Underhill, mm -hmm. a Canadian jazz saxophonist, but there is so much more to him than that. He's a founding member of the jazz fusion group, The Shuffle Demons. He has toured Europe and Canada to critical acclaim for over 27 years. You don't look that old, Rich. <laughs> uh, like Rich has won a 2003 now. Juno Award for his jazz solo debut, Tales from the Blue Lounge, and was nominated for the Prix de Jazz at the 2003 Montreal Jazz Festival. He followed that up with the Juno-nominated Moment in Time in 2005, the Juno-nominated Kensington Suite in 2007, and his 2010 release, Free Spirit. Richard Underhill is one of Canada's most distinctive jazz performers, known for his warm alto sound and his warm personality. <laughs> Great writing and arranging skills and in from the outside soloing. He was awarded, oh my goodness, he was so awarded much the Roy Thompson really, Hall you know. of Recognition in 2008 for his contribution to Toronto's musical and artistic community. And he also took home second place in the International Songwriting Competition in 2008. Ooh. Second, wow. Second that place. First We're loser. Done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and that's not even covering his hockey night in Canada theme, being the leader of Blue Rodeo's horn section, a member of the very funky Astro Groove, and running for mayor. Clearly, we don't have enough time to cover everything, but let's try. <laughs> Welcome, Rich Underhill. Oh, wow. thank oh, you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> wow. the, the hockey night in Canada it, theme? We did the hockey night in Canada theme. It's really funny because uh, um, we did a... It was 2004. The Shuffle Demons were 20 years old. We wanted to come back because we'd taken a break with a storm. We did a world record, the most saxophone players playing a song, and we picked the Hockey Night in Canada theme. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, I see. Okay, people okay, would cool, know cool. it, and we had done a cover of, of it on an earlier album. Funny thing is, though, as soon as we did that, then there was a contract, you know, dispute with CBC, and the Hockey Night in Canada theme is no longer on Hockey oh, Night in Canada. Oh, that's right. Yes. When it went to Rogers, CBC didn't hold on to the rights. Yeah, and, like and previous to that, there was a. It was originally written as a jingle. This, is, this goes into songwriting, actually, right. which is an interesting point. It was written by a jingle uh, as a jingle for Esso by a woman called Dolores Clayman. Esso. Mm. Yeah, for Esso, because Esso sponsored hockey, and then uh -huh. it became the Hockey Night in Canada theme over time. Then she said, where's my royalties? Well, it was a jingle. Yeah, but now it's not. So they're this, this developed, oh, evolved wow. into, a, into a whole scuffle, and eventually Interesting. she got a, a big whack of dough, which is oh, good. good. But good. It, yeah, as a result a of that, song. CBC lost it. So. Oh, so that's what it was. Yeah. When, when, when does jingle that date back song. to? When, when was that jingle originally written? Oh, boy. I think it's 50s, but I'm not oh. sure. Maybe 60s. Maybe 60s. Okay. Yeah. You know what? I didn't. I don't have the dates, but, uh, okay. but Dolores Clayman yeah. is the songwriter, and she had done a lot. She was a real big jingle writer at the time. Yeah, yeah. That's good to well, know. a lovely woman. We have a few other little bits of news, and then we'll get to uh, all rich all the time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Neil, you have some some bad news. Yeah. So the the thing I heard today on, on social media is uh, so it was 11 years ago this month that there was a massive uh, fire um, at the uh, Universal Studios Hollywood in California, and at the time we didn't know this, but New York Times did an investigation that, that just got released that turns out that a lot of early master recordings are were destroyed in the vaults oh, yeah. at, uh. at Universal, and the list of uh, artists uh, for which all these uh, these master recordings are destroyed 
you know, everyone from Billie Holiday, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, all the way up to, you know, more contemporary uh, artists like Neil Diamond, John, Joni Mitchell, even... And up early, to all up to early Nir- rock and roll like rock around the clock and rock around the clock even stuff. even up to like nine inch nails nirvana You're tupac kidding. eminem 50 cent like all, all these things but the the thing about this new york times article that i found most interesting was towards the end of it they talk about how record companies have had a troubled history with such recordings and have been known to trash them in bulk because because i guess universal uh was kind of hush hush about this and they didn't want it want it to be known right yeah these recordings were for, they do take up a lot of space they do take up a lot of space they but do. I guess they were afraid of litigation and all the rest of it mm. but uh, decades ago employees of cbs records reportedly took power saws to multi-track masters <laughs> to sell <laughs> the reels as scrap metal oh, and in the 1970s oh, rca destroyed masters oh, by elvis <laughs> by, by Elvis Presley in, in a broader purge. So, I, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I, it makes me wonder, like, in, in today's day and age, like, everything's digital. So were these... Yeah. Now, I guess it doesn't take up as much space as reel-to-reel. Well, now, so mm-hmm. are these... Were these the master recordings? Like these the are the master, master recordings, tapes, right? and, and they're the multi-track recordings. So they're the they're like the stems. Oh, okay. Wow. So they'd be the multi-tracks, not necessarily the, the, the master. Well, yeah. yeah. the, the beginning yeah. of the article, they refer to master recordings. And later on, they say this, maybe some of them also included um, right. multi-track stems. Because the multi-tracks yeah. would take up a lot. They're yeah. fun, though, because if you can go back and remix them or take samples out of it or, or go back yeah. and yeah. investigate, yeah. oh, what was on that track that didn't get... Put on the album, yeah, exactly. You the know. backing vocals, or yeah, yeah. Well, and those, I mean, those big two-inch tapes. You know, they were they were two-inch huge tapes, and they're yeah. really heavy. But an album would be like ten or twelve of those, exactly. and sometimes even more because they would have yeah, yeah. different versions. So, and, and sometimes the artists don't want it because they don't have any room to keep it. Yeah. yeah. And dragging these things around is tough. My first job, actually, was working at Eastern Sound in the basement, going through their tape library and making right. sure that basically. We found out who owned the t- the tapes and whether or not we want they wanted them shipped to them, yeah. or if we, they wanted well, us to destroy. Yeah, them. Yeah, that was my next yeah. question. Like, why would you go and deliberately destroy stuff? I mean, th- th- this was a fire. Obviously, it was an accident yeah. or something, right? But why would you go and just to d- deliberately destroy stuff? Because like you that run out of room without. Yeah. No, but without. I mean, m- maybe At there was. Yeah. Maybe there down. was a bit of a trying to track down who who was the original artist or try and yeah. get a historical society or somebody. Well, that's to, it. To take yeah. them on. No. Yeah. When you make, the, I'm sure when they made the uh, song. It wasn't precious. They're like, oh, okay, I, I yeah, give yeah. how much? Okay, I'll knock it off and banged off weekend, another hit, or whatever, yeah. <laughs> and go and I'm getting money for it. I don't care. Like you know, yeah. you don't. It's only now that people are kind of you know being so you know. There's a rock and roll hall of fame, and these things are at works of art, and yeah. oh, we can remix it or preserve it. Uh, that wasn't how you thought back then. Well, I got yeah. rid of. A, I had about 35 reels in my basement from the, oh, wow. the two inch days and uh, ga- donated them to a studio because you can record on them still. Some of them. Some right. of them are too old and need to be baked specifically and yeah, at a low temperature for like maybe 200 degrees for a couple of hours and oh. then the, the tape. The the acetate will stick, or the the the, the tape the particles will stick, particles and you can take it off, and then it's gone. Like you can transfer it, and then it's gone. Huh. But uh, I did keep the uh, the first album with Spadina Bus and all that. I kept those tapes, yeah. but the rest, uh, yeah, they were just heavy and sitting there, and you know, mm. I didn't really care. <laughs> yeah. So I was in. I'm in that category. I'm a record label destroyed. Shuffle Demon Masters. Right. So well, no remixing Spadina Bus. <laughs> well, no, I do have those. Oh, okay, yeah. Right, okay. All right. Well, because I uh, know you didn't have them transferred first or anything to. I did. I did. I trans. Not, not a lot of them. The Spadina Bus. You know, like that first yeah. album, Street Nicks, I did. The other ones, I didn't bother with. Yeah. Because whatever we have it, and we have it on a digital. Like we have the two inch, the two track yeah. okay, digital the two master. And I don't know. I just didn't think anyone it, it, would really even care. even digital is not forever. I mean, like, absolutely. Like, like you know, like, like mm-hmm. I, remember, I remember used to back up projects onto like CDs and DVDs, and they mm. they do not last. No, yeah, even, even a few years quicker. <laughs> yeah. Than yeah. Tape, actually. No, I know. Yeah. I have a bunch of of DVDs and CDs that are probably fairly buggy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so maybe maybe vinyl was the right answer. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. Right. Actually, that's right. as as sheet music. As long as the <laughs> climate changes, just get someone to transcribe it to sheet music. <laughs> yeah, so, that's true. So that was some sad news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> my news is quicker and a little happier. Yeah. Uh, Elvis Costello was given the OBE, the Order of the British Empire. He was oh, going wow. to decline Fantastic. it. Yes. But his mother kind of shamed him into it, so um. he decided he would accept it. Though he did say it was kind of depressing because he it made him realize that uh, nobody listened to his lyrics. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> they listened they to his lyrics. Him that. They would not have given him the OBE. Yeah. Yes, uh, but he lives. He lives in Canada now, right? With us. Um, and in New York. And oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Not um, quite God Save the Queen, but still not, not exactly. very pro well, establishment. Well, the dirt down and yeah. pills and soap and shipbuilding and let them dangle. Yeah. Yeah. Is, I mean, is there any, you know, Oliver's Army? Is there any yeah. music out there that's like pro-government, <laughs> pro-royalty, pro-establishment? Um, da, 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 what what what's that band that Stephen Harper likes? Maybe those oh, guys. Oh, seriously? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nickelback. Nickelback. Maybe those guys. <laughs> Nickelback. <laughs> now, let's be nice to Nickelback. Well, then their reels still exist. Yeah, well, um, well okay. you play the saxophone, a decidedly anti-authoritarian instrument, Very banned much. by both communists and Nazis. <laughs> no. Right company. on. No, that's good. You know, yeah. I, I guess the capitalists saw, saw an opportunity, and that's why it's around. <laughs> and and you, you were saying before yeah. before the show, it's a very young instrument in in the, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I'd say uh, maybe it's 175 years. I know I went to the 150th anniversary of the saxophone. Uh, I, did, I did an interview with that, and that was mm, a, lo- a while ago. So it could be 170 now. I'm not sure exactly. Well, what what, what was the sax. precursor to the sax? There must be some other instrument that was kind well, of... Well, Adolf Sachs was this guy who was inventing all these different kinds of instruments. And it was uh, a lot of it was because they, they needed marching band instruments in the time at the time that projected a bit more. Mm-hmm. You know, the clarinet was a reed instrument that, that was useful, but it was straight and not... It was loud in the high mm-hmm. register, but not in the, the other mm-hmm. registers. Pointed. Down, yeah, down, and so yeah. they wanted things that kind of projected oh. out and had a, a big brassy right, sound. So you could fight with the trunk. Oh, okay. Yeah, you could. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Right. So that that was the original impetus, and he developed actually all kinds of really different weird instruments that were mm. half sax, half half brass instruments. You know, with oh, cool. he had a Dr. whole Seuss line. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Doctor Seuss. Yeah, and so then it basically it refined itself, and he survived many attacks on him and his company and bankruptcies and everything, and and, and now. We have the sax. Yeah. Oh, wow. I was watching a documentary yeah. on the Devil's Horn, and like he was actually, someone tried to assassinate him, killed yeah. his assistant, but. Right. They yeah, tried he, to assassinate him? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the it seems so. The saxophone was yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's strange. They did, maybe it wasn't even just because someone was practicing in the next house. It was, <laughs> it was actually the whole idea of it was yeah. bad. We, we were even talking before the show, like which, which instrument, everyone had a different answer, uh, yeah. which instrument most r- closely resembles the human voice. So right. It was a right. saxophone. And I, I've always heard it was the cello. You said it was a saxophone, Michael. Those are very. Phil uh, said it was the. Said yeah. But those are yeah. very. Those are. There's, there's something that all three of those have, and that's the ability to. A, they're not locked into a tuning system. So right. I can like lip piano. a saxophone <laughs> into different, you know, flat or sharper, depending on, uh, right. you know, either trying to fit in with what's going on if it's a that's because I used to play with DJs all the time actually spinning vinyl Mm. and some of those things you know they drop them half a tone and then I'd have to try and find it or for expressive sort of bends in and that's what the voice does yeah you can glide between notes and And same with the cello same with the violin they can all do that they all have that thing where they can glide in between the notes Uh, whereas piano you're locked in right so it's it's Mm. it's harder and it's a different like it's that percussive hit rather than that vibration right, that so comes out. Mm. Yeah, that feels like the voice box. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, now you were um, okay. I know what the show. Let's <laughs> in, 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 in other words, all of those answers are right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You can. Way to suck up. <laughs> yeah, I know. Come on, man. <laughs> wait, wait. I wanted to uh, so, ask you about I'm um, doing music with a <laughs> with with a horn band. I mean, like something like the like the Shuffle Demons, where you basically yeah. had a full band, but it was just yeah. horns. How would you write? Like, did the stuff come out of jams, or did someone like? Did you write charts for for it? How does that work? Both, yeah, both. Like when we when we started, so we were going to university. I was busking on the street and making as much as my fellow uh, roommate Mike Murley was doing at playing weddings. And he wasn't. Wow. It wasn't a good wedding band, and he didn't enjoy it. And he was like, "Man." I mean, I'll come out with you. So he came out with me, and at that point, he was just sort of doing bass lines on the tenor, and I was playing melodies on the alto. So it was pretty simple, and it was mainly just covering things. Then he brought his friend out, who played, also played sax, and and a drummer. So then we started to have a band, and then we started to come up with things. So Spadina Bus, the big hit, was just a line that that a bass line that one of the sax players played, and then we. We joined in on it, so we just improvised ha- harmony for that, and then he threw a melody over top, and then then we threw backgrounds behind that melody, and that was that's how absolutely simple that was. Well, wow. now now that I've been doing it, for, you know, for the shuffle demons for so long, I definitely most of it I, I write. You know, I'll, if I'm doing the writing, I'll write the imp- the arrangements for, right. and and then it's yeah, you're working with these simple parts, a bass line, and that's 
we have a bass player, so the bass player playing a bass line, and usually an ostinato, like a repeating type thing, and then the melody line, and then the other horns underneath or, or mixed around or, or in. So it's amazing what textures you can get that your brain then starts to fill in the rest of the chord. And right. that's what I like mm-hmm. about it. You know, I'll put a note and then three notes, like a third below, I'll put two notes, a semitone apart. And so you hear that melody note, and then you'll hear this tension underneath, and you, your brain make, fills in the chord, and that's that's what's really cool about oh, that. Oh, right. So you have, the, you have the three horns playing. Yeah. But it's it's our brain that's filling in the extra notes between Yeah, those. the brain is thinking, oh, that sounds... It's basically about tension and release when you're talking about these these horn you know horn parts, and so the brain kind of fills in the other notes and thinks, oh that you know, just in the subconscious way, oh that's that chord, oh that's that chord, and oh, and right. even though the guitar isn't strumming that chord or the piano isn't strumming that chord, so you can hear the harmonies going by based on the bass note and those harmony notes that were. Oh, right. And because they're playing independent lines, so sometimes you get a chord together and sometimes you get counterpoint. Basically. Exactly, counterpoint. And sometimes unison, which can be really strong. You know, it's mm-hmm. a really strong sounding horn section you, you thing you heard. is just It's just everyone playing together but octaves apart. Right. So Maybe we should, since we're on it, why don't we listen to Spadina Bus yeah. now? Yeah. yeah. And then we'll come back and talk a bit more. Yeah, that's good. And there's two different examples. I gave one, both are different styles of writing. So. Yes. Uh, right. So this in Spadina Bus? This is the first kind of style we were talking about where we jammed it together ourselves. Over that bass line? And yeah. The bass line and then, the, yeah. All right. All right.
Woo. on Spadina Woo. Bus. Spadina Bus. Oh, and Shuffle you. Demons. Shuffle Demons. Demons. A Canadian classic. Canadian, Canadian classic. classic. Takes, takes, takes me back. Boys or, uh, I know. Uh, Red Hot Chili, Chili Peppers. Peppers. It's some of the first recorded rap in Canada. Apologize. <laughs> I mean, it's just funny. <laughs> That's it's what, a real rapper. Is that the apology? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's funny. You know, it was a bunch of guys playing on the street in crazy clothes. That, you know, it was, yeah. wasn't particularly... Well, it was cool, but it was a different yeah. kind of cool. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, it's it's really, uh, cool. high-energy street musician entertainment. Yeah, absolutely. I know we'd really perfected our act by that point. We'd been through Europe for three months busking, and, and uh, yeah, we played a lot, a lot, a lot of shows. So by the time we came to record, it was pretty, it was pretty in the pocket. Pretty tight. Yeah. 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 yeah, the groove is just... have seen a, a lot of the world, I think. You've heard quite oh, a Oh, we have. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. South America, India, China, Japan, oh, wow. everywhere. So uh, how does the reception vary? Oh, that's interesting. I... um. Yeah, it it uh, it's usually great, but I, I was interested. I was just mostly recently in in Europe, and and it was fun to see the the differences. You know, like in in, in France and Germany, people are just like boom, they're right on. Yeah, this is great. This is so cool. Um, in Holland, people really like to talk to each other. So I mean, if you play bars, people are chatting the whole time, and at the end they go, "That was great." And I was like, "How would you know? You were chatting <laughs> the whole time." But they're they're cool. And then in Belgium, it's, it's apparently Belgium's one of those places where if you're doing a big rock tour, they start the tour there because the Belgians will just arms folded and look at you like, "Who the hell are these guys? What's this stuff?" Oh. And then if you can get them going by the end, then right. you then you've got you're hot. Like that's that's <laughs> the test. When you go to and I was talking to actually in Holland, one of my street performer friends, and he was saying that about Germany, street performers who go to Germany, come back and their show is terrible because in Germany they can stretch it and take their time, and the Germans lap it up and they love it and it's fantastic and they're just a wonderful audience. Come back to Holland or Belgium, and people are like, oh, this is not tight, and it's shitty, and what's wrong with you? So yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting, though. Well, that's like, cool. Yeah. Jeez. Not to take anything away from any person well, from any country, are, you know. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. vague <laughs> generalizations. Just appreciate, you know, if they're very yeah. specific in what they want, that's, yeah. that's good, and especially if it makes you keeps you on your toes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Well, no, you're... generally well-received wherever we go, and if not, we, we work damn hard to make that happen. Because I was mm -hmm. curious, because the saxophone fits into different cultures musical uh, right uh, histories differently right right that's right where you know where when you in india for example it might be a bit more of a novelty although the lot lots and lots of bollywood music now of course has it right but it's you not can slide and play kind of different scales on the sax even could perhaps another right that's true yeah yeah and there's yeah there, as i say there's lots of incorporation of all kinds of styles in indian music now right so so it's not as much a novelty as it would be, but but Europe, you know, has a longer tradition of these brass instruments and stuff, so that would, it wouldn't be as as different, I think. I want to ask a question about um, actually the writing process. Yeah. Um, so when you're writing stuff now, do you start off on a piano and then and then um, arrange it for the horns, or are you doing it on the horn, or a lot of different ways? The the, the, the I start off on the iPhone or the phone, and uh, We're not being whatever phone it is. So. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Yeah, and uh, I'll just sure. record ideas. That's what I do first. It's like just I'll, do -do -do I'll, I'll, I'll be playing. I'll sometimes be in the middle of a show and I'll, and I'll and an idea will come to me and there'll be someone else will be singing and I'm singing, uh, uh, singing oh, an wow. idea in. While you're mm. watching a show or while you're on while stage? I'm stage? While I'm on stage. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> sure. I'm on stage. Why not? Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then do you do you go back over all these little snippets that you've recorded? And exactly. Then, okay. So then if I'm doing an album... Uh, of my own material, whatever that I'll go back over the snippets and start listening, and some of them are flagged, and I know, and, and I'm, and over time, I'm often working on a song that I'll think, oh, that's a great bridge for whatever ah, that, because right. I often write choruses, and then I find a, a great difficulty writing verses, so then I'll, oh, that could be a verse, and then I'll record that, and I'll labor it verse of whatever song. Mm. So yeah, the the assembling of album part is then going through, listening to all these snippets. Isolating the best ones. Sometimes, you know, I'll transcribe them onto a, onto a music writing program, just the melodies. And then sometimes you'll just, it's so easy then and it's digital to throw one into another one and change the key quickly and then mm. go, oh, actually, uh, what I thought was the bridge for that one is the melody for this one. So I've had many little mashups like that that have worked really well. 
So that's getting the melodic information in. Then afterwards, in terms of writing harmonies and things, I often do it on the computer, sometimes, and then sometimes on the piano as well. Mm-hmm. And and going back to the melodic ideas, sometimes I'll, I'll do sax things too and, and, and usually record it. Same thing, I'll record it and then go back and find it and, and think about it. And then, yeah. and then and these are the sort of you're laying down the grooves for what is to become a, a song with like lyrics and stuff on on top. Or, or are you exactly. talking instrumental music here? No, both. both. Um, yeah. So often I'm laying down sort of melodies to what then I might write lyrics to, or I might have once again I might have a hook, I might have a chorus kind of thing. Even if you're thinking instrumentally, are you still yeah. thinking in terms of verse chorus, like sort of Not song structure? Not quite the same, but similar. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, it is different instrumentally. I'm often thinking of melody bridge rather so it is yeah. sort of like verse chorus i guess but it's not it's true sort of an a part and a b part yeah thing. but it's not like that it's not like the chorus keeps coming back as a hook the same way it's interesting right. and i don't know if that's something i could maybe learn to do more when i was writing for instrumental stuff is uh, jazz structures are they different than what we'd consider to be pop structures that's something i've always kind of wondered well jazz structures are often based on what were the pop songs of the day in the, in the 30s 40s 50s you yeah. know that sort of thing so jazzers would take those songs a lot of those structures are really sort of a like there's one of them a a b a so right. you know two times through a, a melody a bridge thing back to that melody and and the endings of those of those a's might be different right. or a b a c once again same kind of thing mm-hmm. eight bars of a statement and then a little b section then back to that one and then at the c section is different so those are some sort of standard and it's really based on old time mm. um uh, pop writing you know sunny side of the street that sort of stuff those yeah. sort of songs american you know? songbook. yeah american mm-hmm. songbook exactly but, but, and this sort of thing too is kind of a, a fusion jazz funk yeah um, so this we of kind of throw that out the window i yeah. mean especially with spadina bus because yeah. it's it is sort of like one groove that goes on and there it's a 12 bar form that keeps repeating but it's not a blues i mean 12 bar blues is but you a, know it doesn't repeat What's coming up right now? Okay. <laughs> For those just joining us, you're listening to Song Talk Radio, streaming on songtalk.ca, and tonight we're talking about the various ways... No, we're not. No, we're not. Tonight we're talking to Richard Underhill of That's the right. Shuffle Demons. <laughs> Don't forget, we love to hear from you, so please tweet in your thoughts to us at Song Talk Radio or via email feedback at songtalk.ca. We'll share your thoughts here on the show. And you can find links to all the products, books, and web services we mentioned on the show on our resources page at songtalk.ca. And coming up on the show in the next couple of weeks, uh, June 18th, neo-soul artist Robert Ball is joining us. And then on June 25th, we're going to be talking about the hit movie Rocket Man. And the Elton John biopic. Is it a hit yeah. movie? Um, it's, I think it is. Yeah, critically it's acclaimed, it's claimed, I critically yeah, acclaimed. Critically acclaimed. When I, when I went to... I think it's second or third. I, I saw it on opening weekend Sunday night, and that theater was vacant. There was like 12 people in that theater. Really? Yeah. North wow. York Empress Theater. I don't know. Is there a game maybe. on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah, what no, it wasn't game... It? it was sun. It was Sunday after... It was Sunday, the, the weekend that it opened. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I don't well. know if it was game night. Mm-hmm. It's a great movie, though. It was, yes. Yeah. Uh, and if you're in the Toronto area, please join us. Our next songwriters meetup is on Thursday, June the 20th, from 7 to 10 p.m. at the Transat Club. It's uh, free to join and free to attend. Stop by songtalk.ca for the link. Back to you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that next time I write your script, I should get it r- You should get the proper? details right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we'll, we'll have to get the assistance. Uh, you know, actually, I did, but I must have printed it out before I changed it. So <laughs> right. So, so let's get back to the nice structure again. That. So, that was sorry. interesting, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so I, yeah, we had, we had talked about a few sort of typical... Oh, the more old-time jazz structure. Now, if you're listening to modern jazz, you know that 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 also Whatever has changed, goes. and yeah. more of it's kind of through composed, which means you know you might start with the germ of an idea, which might build, but then might go to a different idea by the end. Right. And then most jazz, uh, the main thing is once you've got that melodic statement, then you're improvising over the form of that melody. So yeah. if the statement is 32 bars long, you're improvising over 32 bars. Now, Ornette Coleman blew that all up in the 60s, and, and, and there's free jazz, and, and they didn't really pay attention to the forms. And so there's many different options you can mm. use. But, um, you know, if you're, if, like, I'm, I'm playing tonight at a place called the Reservoir Lounge, and we'll be playing old-time jazz stuff, and, yeah, we'll be soloing over the forms, just, you know, over and over again until we give a little nod or we fade yeah. out at the right moment and the vocalist comes back in. 
Right, we did that. I did that. I played piano in in high school for a fusion band. Oh yeah, and, and it was it was the same sort of thing. It was it was like a little bit of calypso, a little bit of jazz, a little bit of funk, whatever. Fun. And it was like yeah, like a twelve bar, twenty four bar sort yep. of loop, yeah, sort of thing. And then and then the piano and the bass and the guitar would continue comping. Exactly. And then everyone would just take a turn. The saxophones would take a turn. The trumpet yeah. would take a turn. And the drummer took a turn. And we the rest of us just leave the room because we knew he was going to go on for hours. <laughs> doom, 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 and then doom, uh, doom, doom, we'd come back a little while player. later and then. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then you play the riff again. Exactly. And then you're yeah. Out, right. Well, it's so, fun yeah. to talk about this because I think it can take the mystery out of jazz for some people because people think, okay, there's the thing, there's a melody, it kind of, and then it goes into noise for five minutes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and then the melody again. <laughs> yeah. right. But if they can get in their head that it's kind of this similar reform, repeating, repeating over and over again, then they can start to understand, oh that person's playing something really interesting over that yeah. chord, you know, a revelation to the melody. I mean, I often tell students starting out, sing the melody in your head as you're improvising, or at least, or as someone else is improvising. Then you won't get lost. Then you don't have to count bars. You just sing, singing that melody in the background. Oh, and then, right. Like even during a drum solo. Oh, I see what you mean, right. Singing the melody in your head in the background, and then you know, you know where approximately you where so it is. Oh, right. it's amazing. Yeah, and come back and yeah. yeah. Sort of oh, yeah. It. And then, it's yeah, exactly. Tip. And yeah. then you're not... One, just sitting there counting bars, getting lost. Yeah. And two, the, you're really also in your soloing paying respect to that melody. Because I think a lot of the time when you are improvising, you're like, oh, these are cool chords. I'm going to do this, this, and this. Whereas really the song is written and the song is a melody. And that's so yeah. important. As songwriters, you know that. Like the melody is so important. And as improvisers, it's great to be able to quote that or twist and turn it and take it into different directions, not just throw it out the window. And it, it, sounds, it sounds like when you're writing, you go to melody first. You don't go to yes. chord yeah. pattern necessarily. Yeah, most of the time. Sometimes I come up with, yeah, what I think is a cool chord progression and I'll write a melody over top. But a lot of the time it's melody first, absolutely. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I always thought, you know, the problem is that when you hear the the masters of jazz you know doing these these amazing beautiful solos mm -hmm. and it just it it seems like it's so effortless and they're just flipping it off the top but it's you know exactly what the song is and it's beautiful and it moves you along and that's really 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 hard to do yeah. and that's the problem and I always says you know the great thing about punk was that you could fail and you'd still wind up being you know, yeah. interesting by accident. Yeah, but with jazz, great, yeah. But with jazz, when you fail, it's you, it's 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 much less forgiving. It's such a tough, it's such a tough thing. Yeah. Well, you know, and we're failing more than you might know too. And and you know, in our mm -hmm. own way, we're we're. I you use those mistakes as opportunities to go in a different direction. Yeah. And, and Miles said, if you play a, make a mistake, play it twice. twice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> like that's what you were trying to do. You know, so it. it um, it is wonderful when it lines up, and and you play that perfect solo. You know, it happens to all of us every once in a while. Oh, yeah. Some people a lot more than others, <laughs> but when it works, it's you're just like wow. You start listening to yourself. You're not thinking about it. You're just listening to this solo, and, and yeah. that's you doing it. And and sometimes you'll you'll kick yourself out of the mood by doing that, and then you start planning the next note, which is it, it, which can be difficult. But yeah, if you can get to that point where you're just listening to this music, which happens to be you playing, then it, then that's really great. Right. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, you get if and you know, I've been there. And not all the time, obviously, but but when you get yeah, it's just that's why you do it, you know. It kinda makes me think of surfing. I mean pop songs it's so regimented, but uh, jazz like that, the way yeah. you describe it, it's like you try to catch a wave, you try to, and you might fail nine times. Exactly. But then when you catch the wave, there's no feeling like that. It just Right. It's effortless, whereas, exhilarating pop songs, you're not catching waves. You're right, you know. You're trying to give it all your, your all and energy and put yeah. your heart and soul into it. It's a little bit like jazz and classical, too. When you, the, the notes are written down, you know, the, you can only interpret it. The interpretation is really your only improvisation tool, mm -hmm. you know, so you could play it a little softer or with more intensity or whatever, but mm -hmm. the notes are written down. You can't change the notes. Yeah. In jazz, you can change the notes, and so it is dangerous. I mean, I always say it's like jumping off a cliff together with a band and, and mm -hmm. making a parachute on the way down and landing <laughs> safely, you know? That's, that's my little analogy, because that's what you're mm -hmm. doing together, especially in the most creative situations. Yeah, and, and that's where the free jazz gets really ob obtuse for people, because yeah. then then the melody is, is, is free, and the structure is free, exactly. and everything is free, because a lot of the time, if you're soloing over what is a pretty regimented groove, right. then it, it sort of it sort of lays the foundation, and kind of sort of anchors the whole thing down. Exactly. Right? It's very different 
different different thing. People to hold on to, yeah. I mean, I uh, I when I try to approach free jazz playing like songwriting, you know, so it may be like, burp, 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 but that's a little motif that then I like to repeat, you know, yeah. like, burp, burp, that's my little statement, and then I'll come back to it, and then the B section will be, burp, you know, a different yeah. statement. So when I do free music, I really try and shape it more formally so, okay. so you, you, got, you guys got some touch points to kind of yeah come back to. It, it's yeah. more interesting for me and, and as an audience member it's way more interesting too i think mm -hmm. because often people hear free and they click in their brain and then they just just start playing jerking around for like <laughs> half an hour you know it's, <laughs> it's not i don't it can be fun for if you're doing it but it's really usually not fun if yeah, you're listening it sounds yeah. fun for the musician maybe yeah. not so much for the audience yeah. in that case but even when I'm playing in that situation and people aren't really listening, and that's the key it's the, in jazz, is listening mm -hmm. to what's going on mm -hmm. and trying to add to that or, you know, take it in a different direction if you if you want, but just respond and, and be part of that moment. You yeah, know? They, well, they always say jazz is like the most collaborative of all the mm -hmm. musical forms, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. A lot yeah, of people when they're... Um, when they're in polka. <laughs> 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 a lot of people when they're putting, uh, uh, you know, horns into their own music, sometimes yeah. they kind of stumble because they they know they want the sound, but they're right. really not sure what to do with it. Do you have mm. any tips for people who are like maybe sitting at home with a computer, they have like a... Yeah, right. And they have like some jazz patch that they want to put into it. Like, right, how right. would you approach that? Right. Yeah. You... Uh, were the uh, leader of the horn section for Blue Rodeo. Right, exactly. Okay. And how was it? Because yeah. they didn't have horns on they those didn't. songs when you came in. And That's did. right. Yeah. Then we, I came in and arranged a bunch for them. So that was a really interesting challenge. And it's been, it was, it was interesting. I got really good at it when MySpace was going because <laughs> I had a, that. I had a MySpace robot that asked people to be my friend. I thought, oh, because some of, so one of my, one of my friends had like 2,000 friends. I was like, how the hell did you get that? I had a robot. Oh. Amazing. So then I was. I started. I started. <laughs> I, getting, I started adding 500 people a day religiously, which was you know obsessive compulsive to the max. But you know, obsessive compulsive behavior always produces results. <clears throat> that's true. That's my little. <laughs> that's my little tagline. Anyway, so I, I, eventually MySpace became bands friending bands. Like there was no fans left yeah. anymore because they were getting mm. barraged by bands all the time. But I was barraging bands, and then bands would go, hey, we were just looking for a horn section. Could you? And so I got all these gigs doing it, which, oh, which wow. really gave me a lot of practice. Huh. That's long-winded. But basically what I would say is try, um, you know, maybe don't overdo it. Um, think about how it, how it helps the song. So, I mean, what I'll often do is... You know, there's the intro. That's where you might want to do, unless it's sort of a soft, you know, build. But if it's an intro, you want to hit them over the head. Hey, boom, we got horns. Here it is. Bang, bang, bang. And then bring it down. Let the band do their thing. Come in on the chorus, you know, mm -hmm. and then maybe come in on the second verse with some backgroundy stuff. And then a little bigger on the last cor on, the, on the next chorus, maybe a couple of backgrounds behind the solo and then a big final out. That's kind of the general shape of what I like to do. Mm -hmm. So you announce your presence, but then, you know, you really are serving the vocals, serving the melody, serving the band, not mm -hmm. necessarily forefront until there's that moment. And uh, what I, I did in Blue Rodeo, though, was try and push it, of course, which was fun. And mm -hmm. they did Diamond Mine, which was a great long, long, long piano solo. Uh, originally Bob, oh, yeah, Bobby yeah. Wiseman, but then James Gray at the time, we were doing it. Um, and, uh, and so I wrote some real spy-type backgrounds oh, cool. you know which which really fun and it, it gave it a cool kick you know and and it gave them what they wanted too they didn't kind of john barry stabs. yeah <laughs> really cool stabs and weird rhythms and things and it just it, it was fun for them it gave them that jazz thing in the right moment but you didn't do that in days in between or, or you know songs that were more more straight ahead you know you waited for the moments and that's what it is is you know waiting for the moments when you can pull the elastic and stretch it but right. when when it really isn't right and you know it can be it can sound a bit mishmash so for, for you for you is it is is it just as creatively rewarding to support a band like Blue Rodeo as opposed to doing like when the Shuffle Demons for example it, it's kind of the heart of the song this is the right. is the horn groove right exactly right? Yeah. where where that it's kind of a it's kind of an add-on thing mm -hmm. does, yeah. it, does it matter either way well i yeah i i like them both and they are different they're different emotions i mean when it's the Shuffle Demons i'm kind of leading it and so it's a bit more focus and pressure so mm -hmm. that's good and bad you know you 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 get to control what's going on but because you're controlling what's going on you can screw up <laughs> you know so 
So <laughs> well, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's almost like the inverse thing. Like everything <laughs> yeah. else has to support the horn group. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. And 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 so with rodeo, it's you know you're supporting the song and the singer, and then you have your little moment to shine. You know, there'd be a solo or eight or ten or eight bars or twenty four bars or whatever, and that's that that you got your moment. And I mean, with them, that moment maybe was in front of. 15,000 people or we did the SARS concert that moment was in front of 400,000 people so that's a different you know, there's less pressure in some ways and more in others. Right, right. <laughs> so. And what, what about the the details of, of arranging, you know, for for three different horns mm-hmm. or something mm-hmm. like that? Like you got to be you got to be sort of aware of the ranges of the different instruments yeah, and that exactly. sort of thing. Like I think Phil, you were alluding to like someone's doing it at home on yeah, like a yeah, it's like, or like and it sounds sort of kind of dumb, probably simple, but I mean, it's if you know if you're a guitar player or you're a piano player, yeah, and you have a like a C7 chord. Right, it's exactly. kind of jazz. Yeah, um, yeah, nice. Um, <laughs> so if you have a C7 jazz, I mean, what would you be, would you be doing the, like the the octave and like a third or an octave and a fifth? Yeah, it, well, it really or, depends on, yeah, it depends on what kind of, uh, what, what what the song's like, right? If it is C7, then you might want to add, add some colors into it. So you might, we often do, if we're doing horn arrangements on the fly and there's two of us, it's funny, two is easier than three because mm-hmm. really? while there's oh. two notes, then you can pick the juiciest notes, which are seven and third. So oh. play the flat seven and the major third, and that's a tritone in between yeah. the devil's interval. Right, right. But that, <laughs> as they say, so that, uh, with horn players, we go, we, we'll start and, oh, they're doing the third. Okay, I'll hit the seven. And then we, we follow it around. I mean, we could do we do on-the-spot horn the pads seven. all the time oh, okay. by just so tracking we, we, around when you, the seven. When you said that, thirds. my intuition was like, well, you're probably going to go with the first and the fifth. Right. Just because no. it's consonant and everything, right? Like right, but that's the thing. You, as the horns are adding more color, you're not... Yeah. The, everyone else is taking oh, care of that. Right, yes. right. So, so you're bringing that, out that some of, of contrast. the... Uh, so yeah, some of the, the sweeter or more different notes. Then sometimes, yeah, I might go nine as well. Like we we often do at the end of a song, we'll do six, nine, you know, if we're, uh, so Ooh. to speak. <laughs> right. I mean, sorry, family yeah. show. No, I'm just... <laughs> no, no, that's <laughs> the stuff we wanted to talk about, six and nine. No, but right? yeah, <laughs> the, so, you know, if it's in C, we'll play the A... And the and the D, uh, the right. horns might do that. And then if if someone's playing the B flat of the C seven, then there's that clash, and that's what we actually like. That's what we're looking for oh, is that major seven right. clash in horns mm. in terms of giving it that juicy sound. It, it's cool because I, you know, this podcast is a great thing because I heard on the radio Oscar Peterson talking about jazz, mm. and he said jazz musicians are always looking for the major seventh interval. So either that that little class, a semitone or a major seven. And so oh. we'll take a minor chord, like D minor right. seven or whatever, and by adding the nine, between the third and the nine, you get that major seven. So you're always looking for that oh, major seven right. or, or, or semitone or tone crunch. And mm-hmm. it, that's the crunch that really makes the horns jump or, you know, just gives it that, oh, wow. that grind that makes it sound cool. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. and and then on the other hand, if you want to do something really powerful, that's when you go unison or octaves, and then it sounds like the biggest thing you've ever heard. Like right. a lot of the Afrofunk music, which I really love, is you know trumpet, baritone sax, and and tenor sax, and they're like three octaves it's apart, each static. one covering a different octave. All and playing it's the root. This, yeah, they're all playing the melody, but okay. they're all they're not playing harmonies together, and then that's like. This is, you know, they, everyone else is grooving, and this is the most powerful horns you've ever heard. What are they? What notes are they playing? Oh, they're all playing the same notes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, is, wow. is that when you get more into like the pop side of things, like the Earth, Wind, and Fires, and the, pop, the Phil Collins and those kind right. of guys, and right, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, and and, yeah. and the arranging techniques would be also, you know, on some part you'd all play unison, and on another part you might play harmony. I'm mm-hmm. often the pads, which are the you know the whole notes behind. A, a softer section or a section you don't want stabs in the way of the vocals right. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Then you'll play nice chordal pads, you know, going along. And then when it gets to the chords and want some some jump, then you'll play the stabs. Oh, okay. This yeah. is really cool. We have one more song to play, I think. Oh, yeah. yes. So, this, yeah. It's just about this one. All right, this is Sell Me. This is from uh, the Shuffle Demons' latest, although we have another one coming, but it's not quite done, unfortunately. But this is about five years ago. And, yeah, this is an idea that I had for the, for the song, once again, recording on my phone. And then these horn horn lines are very written out. It's, it's, it's what I did. But also, they're, you know, they, there's the odd cut-and-paste mistake that you make with your music program, which... <laughs> 
changes things. And like, oh, <laughs> hey, that's a good <laughs> idea. And so there, there's a little horn soli, so a horn, not a solo, but all of us playing together, they call a soli. And there's we go up different intervals, and that that was one of those things that are so easy to do with your cut and paste on your once you've got it in the digital. But it, it sounded pretty cool. Is so this an alto, or are they still? Two yeah. Tenors? So this is actually alto, two tenors, and because it's a Magic recording, we added baritone as well. So this has got four, not three. Oh, cool. Nice. There you go. Great. So you, 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 you were writing the lyrics for these songs as well? For that one, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. so I, did, I I do write lyrics for a lot of the Demons ones. Sometimes we collaborate and sometimes other writers, you know, it just depends. Okay. But uh, the, the latest album, I end up being, uh, yeah, fairly heavily uh, involved in all aspects. <laughs> so you like, because you, right this sounds no, almost... Just the one who stepped up. <laughs> but you wrote all the lines for this, like actually... Have that one, yeah. So, that yeah. one, I basically wrote every all the all the horn lines, the bass line. I mean, the drummer came up, the Stitch came up, the drum groove. But, yeah, because yeah. Yeah. Stitch. Yeah, yeah, and, you get, so the, and then you have that one solo yeah. section in the middle where it's, yeah. it's a little more free, right? Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. Still, but still, like we were saying before, like still pinned down by the groove. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the Demons will be touring, and eventually there'll be another album? Is yes. About it later? Yeah, I'm hoping mid-July or something. Oh, so soon. Yeah, it's soon. Yeah, I just need sort of this last tune, lyrics for the last tune, and our artwork, and the mix. most of the mixes are done. So we're getting there. It's hard when you're touring, though, to focus on an album, you know? It's yeah, yeah. the logistics. And do you still do all your, your arranging, or do you have a tour manager now? Well, it's interesting. So St for the Shuffle Demon, Stitch has been, uh, be, you know, when we did the 20th anniversary, he said, man, I want to be more involved in the managing. I'm like, okay. And 
he, it turns out he is amazing at finding gigs. He, he, he hunts down gigs all over the world. He's really great at getting um, government support. Like if we're playing in Ecuador, he'll say, hey, Canadian embassy, you, you know, we're coming down. You should throw some money at this. And so they'll throw money. And, and then he sets it up. I sort of get together with him and discuss it and then go, okay, you know, let's not do those because they don't seem doable, but everything else seems great or whatever, mm -hmm. or everything seems great depending on what he's come up with. Then we apply for a grant together. Then I take over, and if we get the grant, then I'm the road manager. So then I do all the booking of flights, booking of hotels, road managing stuff. So he's kind of the pre, and you're the yeah, I'm the yeah. The nice. and, you know, it's, it works out really well in terms of a partnership that way, because doing both of those jobs plus trying to play, it's just too much. Even though the internet has made it much easier than it was in my, in back when I used to do it. Can so, we talk about the structure of this song? Yeah, sure. Because you see, like, you got that riff off the top, and then and then the sell me this because I wanted that part, yeah. and then yeah. and then the second part seems like something different. Like it seems a little bit freer than right. Yeah, than normal the, normal pop song structure for sure. I guess so. Yeah, because it sort of starts with the sell me this. Which is kind of a chorus up out front. Yeah. Then I go into I want a red one and a green one. Then that yeah. was kind of a verse structure, and then it went back into sort of a. So I want a blue one. All that stuff that is that you know the the chords the, the harmonic structure different. It there? does change a bit. It yeah. Change yeah. There, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to think of it now. Yeah, it does. It does move around a bit more. Exactly. And the horn lines in the background kind of. Yeah, they're definitely that. different. And the, yeah, and, the and then it goes into chord. the solo, which is just on one chord basically. But then it goes into this um, the soli section, which kind of climbs up, climbs up, right. climbs up, and goes to a chord which you were saying sounds a little bit like the pick up the pieces. Uh, yeah, the break. Uh, yeah, pick up the pieces. And then back to the chorus again at the Let's end. Let's pick up the pieces. Average white band. Average white band. It was a it was a big hit back in. Bob the dee up, Bob dee dee Oh, that song. Okay. I know that scene. There's yeah, that's really funny. Like Crazy. Scottish it's funky. funky, yeah, I know. Like the wine Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did you think? <laughs> Alabama? Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, no, 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 well, I was not Oh, I'll pick up the pieces. The, <laughs> the chanted. Yeah. No, I don't think they this went pick up the pieces. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. they also did work to do, right? Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly there. But, you know, it's kind of like the J.B. Horns, you know, pass the peas kind of thing, right? <laughs> so how long would it take for you to, like, write and Because there's the... You know, most of us, we we write with guitars or a yeah. piano. So you have these chords and you sort of go, la, 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 yeah. and then you find some words and you put them in, and, yeah. and then we have some structure. But you're actually doing... You're sort of doing that, but then you have to sort of notate it, and then... Right. Um, and, of course, by now you know how to write for all the different horns, yeah. which all have different keys for some strange reason. I never understood why they just couldn't all use the well, same Well, the one. main thing with that is that you want a C on one horn to be a, the fingered as a C on another one, so, but they are a fourth, you know, they're, they're yeah. different sizes. So they're just two, actually, E-flat and B-flat saxophones. Yeah. So there's okay. just two kind of transpositions you need to know. And often we're reading it someone will bring in a concert chart so you got to make that transposition in your head and that oh that's, really that's one of the things that yeah that we do so most chord changes if if you give them to me pre-transpose for alto sax i get lost because i do the transposition automatically because i chord symbols i always transpose almost mm. notes are often transposed for me when someone writes a part right so it's it's that funny thing like hey we made it easier for you oh no it's harder because now i'm transposing the c oh, i shouldn't have because some people can just like look at a, a written piece of music and just play it like magic you know yeah. right off the top yeah you know um, i'm okay with that but not i, I would say pay it play it like uh you know Amateur magic. <laughs> Can, how, how, how is this? How is it not, an hour gone by? I, I know, know it's crazy. fast. What the heck? We didn't talk about you playing with Amy Winehouse. We didn't oh, talk about I you know, Doctor John. We didn't talk about you running for mayor. You'll have to come back know, on the show. So many yes, things. We talked to. about song structure, but hey, that's what you guys are about here. Well, that's I, right. I think it's. That's our I think thing. it's really great that, that you're doing this, and and it's really inspirational for people who who want to write music and be part of this. So good, great. good on you. Thanks well, for having me. Cool. Thanks for coming. Solo stuff or one of your other bands. Sure, man. Anytime. Excellent. 
Well, that is all the time we have tonight. I'm sorry. So on Song Talk <laughs> Radio, special thanks to our guest, Rich Underhill. Yay! Hey, hey, thank you, Rich Richard. Talk. Rich, how can our listeners hear more of your music? What kind of social? Yeah. So at you... Rich Underhill is a Twitter and Instagram, and RichardUnderhill.com, ShuffleDemons.com. Um, you know, they, they, the websites need improving, but they're there. And yeah, you can find us on YouTube. You can find Spadina Bus on YouTube. Is there still a MySpace and, page? Or no? uh, <laughs> you know, I bet there is. But <laughs> MySpace is around. the password. <laughs> oh no! Remember, someone uh, bought my space. I don't need, I don't need like the password to dollars. view it. Yeah, I know. Already <laughs> done. We'll links up. So, for the audience, please send us your impressions via Twitter at Song Talk Radio, via email at feedback at songtalkradio.ca, Facebook and YouTube on Song Talk Radio, or stop by the site at songtalk.ca. Subscribe today to the Song Talk Radio podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher.com, Spotify, or Podcast Addict, and don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter at songtalk.ca. You can find links to all our products, books, and web services that we mention on the show at Song Talk Radio on our resources page at songtalk.ca. If you're in the Toronto area, please join us at our next Songwriters Meetup on Thursday, June the 20th from 7 to 10 at the Transact Club. It's free to join at meetup.com and free to attend the, the meetup. So come by at songtalk.ca and find yeah. out where. <laughs> All right, yeah, thank they're, they're you very nice to in person. Micah. Uh, on social media. Thank you, Micah. Thank Yay. you to Rita on the tech board. Thank you, Rita. And most of all, we'd like to thank you, the listeners. Thank you can you. follow Neil at neilmodi.com. Phil at the Phil Emery on Twitter. Vanessa's not here, so she didn't get a say. Micah. Micah. Jimmy Micah on Instagram. Yay. And Rita, Jimmy are Micah you. On uh, no, no, Rita's no, time no, out. No, no. Oh. Yeah. I'm still being creeped out of being cool. followed, so I'm good. Yeah. Uh, so And stop by the website at songtalk.ca to browse past shows and find out how you can be a guest. Keep on writing. Good night, See everyone. Ya. Take care. Bye-bye.